Brian here. I was born into a world of post-war austerity on the 2nd of January 1951. Although obviously I was unaware of this social condition at the time. King George VI was on the throne and Winston Churchill was Prime Minister. In 1952 George VI died and our present Queen Elizabeth II was crowned. The earliest memory I have is of being taken to see the Queen being driven along King's Road at Stoke Plymouth on her coronation tour. The city of my birth, Plymouth, had been very heavily bombed by the Luftwaffe not many years previously, and in my youth the scars were still evident everywhere. As a child, our playgrounds were the still standing remains of bombed out buildings and the rubble strewn places where buildings had been raised. When not at school, we would explore these places with our friends and had many hideouts where we could escape the observation of adults. One of our favourites was the remains of a bombed Catholic convent next door to the cathedral. The authorities had gone to the trouble of sealing the entrances, but we had devised methods of entry and spent many happy hours there, free from adult supervision. Compared with the children of today, we enjoyed much more freedom. We would arrive home from school, eat tea and go out to play. This could involve travelling miles away from home by foot or bicycle. At weekends and school holidays, we would often go out in the morning and not return home until the evening when hunger brought us back home. Home for us was a place to eat and sleep. The next event of note that I remember was in 1953 when Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing became the first men to climb Mount Everest. There were very few cars at this time, so the roads were comparatively safe. Motorised transport was the prerogative of the better off. The only person I knew who owned a car was a doctor. Even the police rode bicycles or walked. Beer in the local pubs was delivered by horse and cart, known as drays. Magnificent great shire horses whose droppings were highly prized by allotment owners and gardeners, my grandfather included, who would collect it with a bucket and shovel. Street lighting was by gas lamp. Every evening each individual lamp was lit by a gentleman with a long pole, with the reverse process happening in the morning. The process was quite a social thing, with the men who performed the task being a valued part of the community. At home, there was no central heating or hot running water. If you wanted to a bath, the process involved filling the bath with cold water, then transferring the water into a copper boiler by hand with a saucepan, then waiting ages for it to heat up, and then filling the bath with the warm water using the saucepan again. Not surprisingly, baths were usually taken only once or twice a week. The process was made more onerous for my grandparents who lived upstairs because they had a galvanised sink bathtub which they carried upstairs from the small courtyard. This had no tap or drain so had to be emptied with a saucepan as well. There was one toilet and it was outside in the courtyard. There was also perhaps obviously no central heating or double glazing. Our house had seven rooms of which only two were heated. Downstairs in our kitchen was heated by a small paraffin heater while upstairs my grandparents' kitchen had two, a two-bar electric fire. Paraffin was delivered by van around the streets door to door and came in pink or blue, though I am unsure of the difference. When I was very young, we had a wind-up gramophone with a large trumpet device instead of a speaker. This played 78 RPM records that all seemed to be very scratchy. The music was either classical or big band swing. Pop or rock as we know it now had yet to make an appearance. 
These were the conditions in Britain when in 1954 the US Navy launched the world's first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus. We had a television set. This was black and white and had only one channel. Program started at 4pm with children's hour and finished at about 10pm when the national anthem was played. Many people would stand at this point even though in their own homes. My grandmother would not watch anything with violence in it. This included nature programs where animals eat each other. My grandfather would not watch anything of a sexual nature. Not that there was much of that at the time. Between them they switched off often. Not everyone had a television. We were quite privileged. Just about everyone had a radio though. People entertained themselves at home by playing cards, board games or reading. In my grandparents' generation, before radio and television, they all played various musical instruments. I think that this was much more fun than watching the television. It was an early realisation for me that the increasing encroachment of technology on people's lives could lead to a deterioration in the level of their skills. In 1956, Elvis Presley had his first hit with Heartbreak Hotel. In 1957, when I was six years old, the Russians launched a small basketball-sized object they called a Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. It was able to bounce television and telephone signals between the continents. It was better known to us as Telstar. It orbited the Earth every 96 minutes and was the first man-made satellite. This was the start of what became known as the space race. Two years later, in 1959, the Russians crashed an unmanned space capsule, Luna 2, onto the moon. Also in 1959, Fidel Castro started the only communist regime in the Western world after his successful invasion of Cuba. In 1960, the pill became available for the first time and brought about the moral disintegration of the Western world. At least it did if you were a retired colonel in Goldarmin. In 1961, the Russians erected the Berlin Wall to stop their citizens from escaping to the West. Home decor was very dull. There seemed to be only three colours, dark brown and cream or bottle green and cream. Every house I went to in as a child was either one scheme or the other. Colour was also conspicuous by its absence from clothing which was drab and functional. Although there were no washing machines, life was made considerably easier for the lady of the house by the laundry service. All our laundry would be tied in a bundle using a sheet as the outside and collected by Mill Bay Laundry. It would be delivered back home clean, ironed and nicely packaged in a brown paper bundle. There were no fitted carpets anywhere in our or any other house that I visited as a youngster. The floors were covered with linoleum and the old small rug. The passageways and staircases in many of my friends' homes were bare on polished wood. The other items that were missing from our home which would be considered absolute necessities today were the telephone, the computer and the refrigerator. We had none of these things. The telephone, like the car, was a plaything of the wealthy. We didn't get one until I was 18, and then it was a shared line with neighbours. Computers did exist by then, of course, but they were the size of houses and needed a team of scientists to operate them. They had less computing power than a modern watch and had no impact whatsoever on people's daily lives. At the time we got the telephone, we also got our first fridge freezer. My grandfather used to turn it off and unplug it before he went to bed, so it was never successful. My grandmother never learnt to use the phone. She would hold the wrong end to her ear and shout into the, to the other wrong end. Uh, most everyone lived primarily in their kitchens. The front room or drawing room, if you want to be posh, was only used for entertaining guests or family gatherings like Christmas. This room contained all the best furniture and would have undoubtedly been the most comfortable to live in on a daily basis. 
The exception to this living arrangement was my great aunt Effie. She lived in a grand house called Ladywell Lodge. She lived in a drawing room because she was bedridden. She had been an accomplished pianist but could no longer play due to suffering rheumatoid arthritis. Also in a drawing room there lived the Steinway Grand Piano. None of these things was a problem. We knew no different and in many ways I believe that life was better then. As children we spent much of our time outside of the home playing with our friends and thereby enjoying a level of freedom that is denied to most children now. We were however subjected to a much higher level of discipline though I do not believe that this was a bad thing. All children misbehave, all children push the boundaries, all children get away with as much as they can. As a child I was no different. There were though a whole raft of consequences to being naughty. We were left in no doubt that our behaviour was unacceptable and not going to be tolerated. We were smacked and told off by our parents, we were smacked and told off by our neighbours, we were smacked and told off by the local policeman and by any adult anywhere who caught us misbehaving, whether they knew us or not. We were also smacked and caned by teachers in school. If you continued to misbehave, you could be sent to an approved school. This was a bad place where the discipline was much harsher. We were afraid of being sent to the approved school. If your behaviour was really bad, you could be sent to Borstal. This was a prison for youngsters that had an extremely harsh regime. Borstal didn't even bear thinking about. I went to school from the age of four and a half to the age of 15. I did not enjoy it at all. The only useful things I learned were how to read and write, though I had already started to do this before I started school, and basic arithmetic. Everything else was a total waste of time and I've never found any practical use for anything they taught me. The standard of teaching in my school was extremely poor. I never had a teacher who could make a subject interesting. To a man, they could take a fascinating subject and turn it into boring dross. It was, I'm sure, in art form they perfected on generations of small, unwilling captives. Having failed to pass the the 11 plus examinations, I was dispatched to a secondary modern school where I experienced my one and only interesting lesson. The science master half filled a glass bowl with water and then floated a nightlight candle on, on the water, placing it a glass jar over it. As the candle burned, the oxygen in the jar, the water level rose inside the jar. When all the oxygen was burned, the candle went out and the remaining space in the jar was a vacuum. I still clearly remember this lesson, though it was 51 years ago. So interested I was. We never had another science lesson. The master left to join the fleet arm and was not replaced. Although I did not enjoy lessons, I did enjoy reading. By the time I failed my 11 plus, I had read Treasure Island, Robinson Crusoe, The Last of the Mohicans and The Tales of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. The reading habit has stayed with me all my life. We were once told that we were to have a sex education lesson. This lesson was given by a Catholic priest who explained to us the mating habits of worms. Worms are hermaphrodites, so each worm has both male and female sex organs. They spin a cocoon around themselves and impregnate each other. This is what passed for our sex education. You may begin to understand what I meant about the teaching standards. Other lessons were no better. The school had no gymnasium, sports field or musical instruments you could learn. Uh, it was compulsory to leave at the age of 15 and not one pupil with any form left with any form of examination pass in the whole history of the school. Quite often I bumped off altogether, so boring it was. And why not? I was not even going to get the chance of taking exam an examination. You had to be careful though. The police would grab you if they saw you out during school periods. Oh, I was never caught. My childhood coincided with a succession of long hot summers. We would gather up with our friends. This had to be carefully organised as mobile phones were not to be available for many, many years. 
you could not ring or text anyone to find out where they were. So if you didn't know beforehand what the plan was, you were going to be on your own all day. We would spend the day at Plymouth Hill, swimming and sunbathing. This was a good one for me, as the whole cafe was run by two of my great aunts, Mamie and Kathleen. I knew I would be fed and watered. There were four swimming pools on the hoe, plus two pebble beaches and the main only swimming area. There were also two rafts moored off one of the beaches that you could swim out to and the high sea diving board. During the summer, Plymouth Hoe and its pools were always packed with people. There remains only one pool now and that has very few swimmers. The high sea diving board and the two rafts are long gone too. Some days we would cycle to Buffersand Beach or catch the ferry from the Barbican and walk from the fort. There were two beaches at Buffersand and between them there was a rocky inlet. That was our favourite spot away from the throng and we could dive from the rocks. At the time the fort was empty and derelict. Needless to say we knew ways to get in and explore. Another favourite we used to cycle to was Whitsound Bay and Tregantle one of the best kept secrets of Cornwall. Literally miles of white sandy beach. You could have thousands of people on it and it would still look empty. There is a steep climb down to these beaches though and in the case of Tregantle, the path runs through the middle of an army firing range. If we felt like some serious exercise, we would cycle 18 miles to Big Brion Sea and Burr Island. My great-grandfather Richard Macaulay died in the hotel on the island. Apparently he got drunk, fell asleep with the window open and died from hypothermia. He was some sort of signwriter painter who was working inside the house during the winter period. Sometimes we would cycle inland instead. Shaw Bridge was a particular favourite of mine. My all-time favourite was to catch the ferry from Admiral's Hard and Stonehouse to Kremel and then walk the coast path through Mount Edgecombe Park to the twin villages of King Sand and Corsand. There we would spend the day on the beach and catch the ferry back from Corsand Beach to the Barbican. Mount Edgecombe House and Park had been earmarked as the future country home of Herr Hitler after the German invasion of Britain instead of which it ended up belonging to an itinerant Australian journeyman sheep shearer who had no idea he was the only surviving relative of a British earl. The swimming season was a short one. The only indoor swimming pool in Plymouth at this time was in the Royal Naval Barracks and was only available to service families. We were very young doing this stuff from the age of seven or eight without adult supervision. That's why I say we had much more freedom than modern children. Closer to home, we had a secret valley that we discovered hidden between two railway bridges. We had to open a locked door using four lollipop sticks, cross the rails and then climb down a bank to reach it. We were never disturbed by adults while we were there. I recently took a sentimental trip to see it, but sadly it no longer exists. Part of it has been filled in and topped by a little park. The part that was not filled in is now a concrete car park. Our secret hideaway in the convent has fared no better. It is now a row of houses. During the months when it was too cold for swimming, we still went off riding our bicycles and walking, looking for new places to explore. There were other empty forts and other such places to visit. We also had various games that we played but were played by generations of children before us. We played marbles, hide and seek, king, war or cowboy games. A game we played on a boats that involved making your opponent put his foot down. Hopscotch, skipping, roller skating and other games I have long forgotten. We would sometimes strap a piece of wood or a hard back book to our roller skates. We had skateboards many years before they were invented. Homemade trolleys were another favourite. Not all of our adventures were so innocent. We once climbed over the fence into a scrapyard and discovered a pile of army guns waiting to be melted down. Needless to say, we appropriated some of them. 
A Melbourne street gang was soon playing war games with real weapons. I had a brain gun, as I remember. It was as big as I was. We never did discover who told the police. We loved climbing trees and never missed an opportunity to do so. This was fortuitous as we also enjoyed scrumping. This is an activity that I haven't heard of anyone doing in many a year and was in fact stealing. We would discover places where there were apple trees and then pretending to be commandos would creep in and take the apples. We weren't always successful and I received several beatings once from a policeman who had observed us going in over a wall and grabbed me as I came out. I used to be terrified of a boy named Charlie who bullied me mercilessly. One day when he started on me I turned on him and gave him a bloody nose. He ran away home crying and his mother chased me with a shovel. After that I never let anyone bully me again. We were youngsters and misbehaved as youngsters will, but there was no real harm in us. We sometimes fought each other or other children who were not part of our little gang. No one was really trying to do any serious damage. You were scrapped until one said he'd had enough, then you would shake hands and be friends. Weapons were considered to be cowardly, as was ganging up on anyone. Kicking was frowned on to. Some of the best fighters were girls. In our gang, Mary was much feared and respected for her prowess. When she grew up, she moved to Australia and became a doctor. The street gangs were territorial, so travelling about town was not without dangers. They weren't going to kill you for trespassing on their turf, but you could expect to be knocked about a bit. We lived at the top of Cecil Street Hill. At the bottom was Rendell Street. The Rendell Street gang were our arch enemies. Going through their turf was the quickest way to get both to the city centre and to the hoe. Fights were frequent. The freedom that we enjoyed was not without cost. I was a regular visitor to the hospital A&E department. I fractured my elbow once, dislocated it 11 times, had a nail right through my big toe, had to have my cheek sewn up when a stone someone threw just missed my eye. I ripped up on my calf muscle and snapped off both of my front teeth. There were too many other minor injuries to enumerate. I was a proper lad and not afraid to have a go at anything. I was 10 years old when Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin rolled his Vostok rocket into the history books by becoming the first man in space. In all probability there were others before him, but he was the first to come back. One of the year's big events for us was bonfire night, November the 5th. This was not as it is now a professional fireworks show or a father setting off some fireworks in the garden for his children to watch. Every little gang of children had their own bonfire, all of them huge. The wood and anything else that could burn was collected by the children over a period of weeks. They were raids to steal each other's combustibles and counter raids to steal it back. It was all great fun. After the fire was set alight, all hell would break loose. It was like the first day of the Battle of the Somme. We would have rockets and Roman candles. These would be fired at each other. Our bangers would be thrown. I once had a tobacco tin full of bangers, which exploded in my hand. Another visit to A&E. As the fire died down, the survivors would bake potatoes in the hot ashes and sit talking and eating them into the night. These bonfires were constructed on bomb sites of which there were plenty to choose from. Sadly, today's children will never experience what fun it all was. Firstly, there are no bomb sites left to have a bonfire on, and secondly, health and safety would never allow it. Thirdly, there doesn't seem to be much wood laying about anymore. And lastly, the children are too busy playing in the cyber world to bother. None of the people who lived in our street owned a car or even a motorcycle. The social highlight of the year was the annual street outing. Everyone would go by Charabang to Big Brion Sea for a day trip. It is perhaps hard to realise how exciting this event was for people without transport who mostly never got to go anywhere. Big Bree and Burr Island have always been a magical place for me ever since those early visits. 
Although we lived in a city, there was a real sense of community. Everyone in our neighbourhood knew everyone else, and families had lived there for generations. There were very few strangers. You had a place within that community. You were known and accepted. You felt safe. You belonged. I had two sets of grandparents both living in our street, one set in the same house. I had many aunts, uncles, cousins, great aunts, all living within walking distance and all frequent visitors to our house. I knew I was loved and cared for by many people. My grandfather, Albert Macaulay, was a railway engine driver on the Great Western Railway. He often drove the famous steam engine, King George V. He was also chosen to drive the Royal Train twice. He used to take me to the engine sheds at Lera, sadly long ago demolished. I was allowed to play on the front plates of the steam engines and sometimes even beyond them as they, as they were shunted about the depot. This was wonderful and I was envied by many of the small boys. To this day if I see any kind of steam engine running at a show or rally, I am instantly transported by the wonderful smell of the steam and oil back to the engine shed with my granddad. He had left school at 14 and his first job was to look after the horses at the Three Towns Dairy, Plymouth. Plymouth only became a city in about 1926 when the Three Towns of Plymouth, Stonehouse and Devonport were amalgamated. My other grandfather, Cecil Higgins, was a career Royal Naval man. He served through World War II, mainly on the Russian convoys. These were particularly hazardous with frequent German attacks and extreme weather conditions. He was serving on the cruiser HMS Norfolk and was close by the pride of the British Navy, the battleship HMS Hood, when it was sunk by the German pocket battleship Bismarck. He told me that he was watching HMS Hood all 50,000 tons of her. The battle had just opened and within the first exchange of fire, the herd simply disappeared. One second it was there and then it wasn't. 50,000 ton battleship with 1,500 crew. He said no one could believe what they had just seen. They were all stunned. There were three survivors. After he retired from the Navy, he became a bookies runner. In those days, it was illegal to bet on horse races unless you were actually at the racetrack. He collected illegal bets from people in pubs. Pubs in those days had restricted opening hours. They opened from about 11am to 2pm and then from about 7pm to 11pm. This apparently was because during World War I, workers would get drunk and be unable to fulfil their duties properly. Britain PLC closed down altogether on Sundays. Everything everywhere was shut. You couldn't buy so much as a packet of crisps. Even seaside holiday towns in the height of the tourist season, everything closed. There were no supermarkets, no 24-7 shopping, not even late night shopping. You bought your supplies from the corner shop where you were served by the shopkeeper. He weighed, measured or counted and then wrapped everything personally. You definitely did not help yourself from the shelves, which were anywhere reached behind the counter. This took longer, but it was personal service. Our local shopkeeper would open a packet of cigarettes and sell you one or two, if that was your wish. The time you waited to be served was spent socialising. No one bought a lot. You were restricted by what you could carry in your bag. At home there was no means of keeping food fresh anyway. The weekly shop was many years away. As children we knew that we were going to die soon. We didn't believe that we would live to become adults. Our city was host to the biggest naval base in Western Europe. We all knew that the Russians had missiles with nuclear warheads pointed right at us and that relations between our countries were pretty bad. This came to a head when I was about 12 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Russians were attempting to sight nuclear missiles on Cuba. This is only 80 miles from the US coast. The Americans were, needless to say, not having any of it. 
World War III and mutual nuclear destruction was imminent. Some children were so frightened they had to be sent home from school. After the fall of Berlin in World War II, the American General Patton said the Allies should keep on going to Moscow. He was severely reprimanded and subsequently sidelined for saying this. Sitting in my classroom waiting to be vaporised, I couldn't help but think that he was right. The first James Bond film was released, Doctor No. My father, also in Albert, was a boot and shoe maker by trade. He worked for a Plymouth firm called Parsons. He was caught off in World War II but failed the medical as they said he had a weak heart. He spent the war making boots for the army, hence in a small way he made his contribution to the downfall of Nazi Germany. Part of the D-Day invasion force left from Plymouth on June the 6th, 1944. My father told me he couldn't go to the home to watch it go as they wouldn't let him off work. I could never understand that. Nothing would have prevented me from going to watch this historic event. During the Blitz he would often be on duty all night at the factory as a fire watcher then have to work all day. He hated the firm. When my brother was born he left to work in HM Dockyard Devonport where he spent the rest of his working life as a slinger moving heavy equipment in and out of warships. He was for many years working on nuclear submarines. In his later years when he was no longer as fit and strong they gave him a cushy job looking after the Dockyard Amenity Centre. This was the way it was back then. As you got older and less physically able you were given less demanding work. He was in many ways a strange man. He had a fantastic ability to do mental arithmetic performing com complex calculations in his head at great speed. He had only two interests, politics and Orwell Football Club. He was active in local politics and knew Michael Furt later to become leader of the Labour Party and Lady Nancy Astor, the first female MP as well. He had, however, no discernible social skills, no hobbies and certainly no skills to pass on to his sons. On his wedding day, he asked my mother if she minded if he went to see Argyle play. She said she didn't mind. He took her at her word and went. When I was three, he took me into town centre and forgot me arriving home and was asked where I was before realising what he'd done. My mother dressed me up in a brand new white coat, white trousers, white shirt and white hat. My father took me blackberry picking. He never smoked or drank alcohol or used strong language. He had made a promise to a stranger when he was a child. He felt it would be wrong to break his promise. In later years I have come to believe that he suffered from a degree of autism. There were a few things that interested him at which he excelled, indeed showing brilliance. Everything else, he was clueless. I was not a Catholic but attended a Catholic school. At that time Mass was said in Latin. I could recite the Latin Mass from memory, word for word. Although I had no interest in the Christian religion, I did enjoy going to Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve with my granddad Macaulay, Uncle Joe and Cousin David, who were all Catholics. After Mass, we would return home to Melbourne Street, where most of the family would be waiting. My, gran my grandmother, with the help of some of my aunts, would have a full Christmas dinner waiting at 1am in the morning. After dinner we would all play cards for pennies until the early hours. Thus on Christmas Day we always had two Christmas dinners, one after midnight mass and another one at midday. My grandmother Dorothy McCauley was unlike granddad and father, a fun-loving party person. She drank half a bottle of whiskey a day and I never saw her without a cigarette on the go. Despite this she lived to be 96. She suffered from agoraphobia and the only time she ever left the house was by tax taxi to visit Uncle George. I never understood why Grandfather didn't like Uncle George until I discovered that he wasn't really my uncle. Her maiden name was Trebilcock and she could trace her Cornish ancestry back to 1750 when Henry Trebilcock married Joanne Bellman in Penryn. They called their son Vincent Bellman Trebilcock. My grand 
mother's father was also called Vincent Bellman Trebilcock. I have no idea why he dropped the Bellman part of the name for his children. There was some talk of an Admiral Trebilcock in the lineage, though I don't know if this is true. Her favourite times were Christmas and New Year's Eve parties. She would spend all year collecting up a huge stock of alcohol in readiness for them. The entire family and friends would descend for an evening of live music and party games. There was also much food eaten and they really were good times. My grandfather would have had enough by about 1.30am. He would sit on his chair in the kitchen and say loudly, Are they making a move yet, Liz? No one ever took any notice. Liz was his daughter, Eileen, and no one ever knew why he called her Liz. Grandfather had a cat called Snooker. Despite the fact that cats are nocturnal animals, this one was not allowed out at night. <coughs> he would walk around the neighbourhood wearing his nightshirt, calling for the cat. Uncle Wilf would take it upon himself to moderate us children's intake of alcohol. He could never understand that we managed to get drunk. We used to secrete the stuff in my bedroom wardrobe before the party started. On Saturdays, there was Saturday morning cinema. The idea being that mother could shop in town, leaving the children in the cinema and her husband in the pub. My father was teetotal and my mother never went into town. I went with the gang anyway. It was always riotous. Several hundred children together without their parents. Everyone would stock up on ammunition to throw a fire at each other. There would be spud guns, homemade catapults, pea shooters, water pistols, all joining in the mayhem. As soon as the lights went down, there would be a huge barrage of missiles coming down right after. When I was, I think, about 12, we stopped going to the Saturday morning cinema and went to Saturday morning. Majestic was the new thing. This was pop music and dancing at the Majestic Ballroom. I discovered I had a talent for dancing and when I danced people would form a circle and watch my moves. Next week they would all be doing them. I would by then be doing something else. Mostly it was girls dancing and boys watching. The girls were dancing groups and if you wanted to dance with one of them you had to approach and ask in front of them all. The girls could be very cruel in the way they refused. They would all laugh at you, and the guys watching from the edge would laugh at you too. It took real nerve to walk up and ask a girl to dance. You would sometimes be kicked in the shins by a small boy, and when you gave him a cuff around the ear, you got to meet his big brother. It was just the lads by this time. There had been seven girls in our gang. We had grown up together, gone to school together, found secret places together, rolled our bikes together, discovered the differences between boys and girls together. We had been inseparable. I can't put my finger, finger on when or why, but suddenly they were not there anymore. They still lived in the street. They still said hi as they passed, but that was it. Suddenly they had become distant. They had become girls. My brother Geoffrey was the opposite of me. He was never a street kid. Six years younger, he preferred to stay at home and study. He would listen to classical music while he studied in our shared room. Actually, it was his room. I just slept there. Unlike me, he passed his 11 plus and went to Devonport High School, where he did even better. When I was 14, we found a pub in Stoke called the Waterloo. This had a back room with a jukebox. The landlord, Olfie, would let us drink in there. We used to drink scrumpy. This was nothing like the rubbish that goes by that name now. It was very, very strong and very cheap. Legend has it that if there's not a dead rat in the barrel, it ain't real scrumpy. I think this is true. The jukebox had one song by Bob Dylan called Like a Rolling Stone. This song lasted about 6 minutes 50 seconds. Most songs were about 2 to 3 minutes. It got a lot of plays as we liked to get our money's worth. We spent many a happy evening there. We liked drinking. We all smoked heavily too. In Bowdoin by our acceptance as customers in a pub, we started drinking at lunch times in another pub near our school. One lunch time we were all sitting there drinking and smoking when our headmaster walked in. 
Having learned the hard way to tough things out, I bought him a beer and gave him a fag. He drank the beer, smoked the fag, told the landlord we were all underage and caned us when we got back to school. Another run-in I had with him occurred when I was accosted in the playground by the class bully. And though the same age as me, he was twice my size and had the shave. I hit him back and he started crying. This was witnessed by the headmaster who insisted that I fight the school boxing champion in the ring as a punishment. I had never boxed in my life. I was also younger and smaller than him. I was getting knocked about quite badly. I kicked him, which put him down. I got caned for that too. Uncles Joe, Wilf and Lionel had all been in the 8th Army fighting Rommel's Africa Corps in Libya and Tunisia and Egypt and then up through Italy. Uncle Joe was a great bloke, married to my father's sister Eileen. He started out the war as a fighter pilot but one day got caught performing some daring acrobatic stunt by a visiting high-ranking officer. He was thrown out of the RAF and spent the rest of the war as a gunnery sergeant in the Royal Artillery. He turned down a commission to remain a sergeant. He was a gentleman who would wear his blazer and tie to answer his doorbell. He would never allow visitors to see him in his shirt sleeves, even us kids. Uncle Wilf was married to my father's sister Phyllis. He was the first person in our family to own a car. He was a very masculine man's man. Uncle Lionel used to entertain us kids with magic tricks. He was, I thought at the time, married to my father's sister Iris. It turned out that Iris was not my father's sister, but his cousin. Great Aunt Mamie had had a relationship with an American soldier. Unmarried pregnancy was a disgrace at the time, so she had Iris in secret, and she was brought up as my grandmother's daughter. Iris had a very dark complexion. This perhaps could be explained by this story. My mother had scarlet fever as a child. This had damaged the mitral valve of her heart. She was very ill all her life. These days this condition could be fixed, but it was a death sentence then. They did operate on her twice, but the operations were unsuccessful. Her blood was not oxygenated properly, meaning she was always short of breath and her lips and skin had a bluish tinge. I never once heard my mother complain. She bore this affliction with heroic stoicism. For my part, I would worry if she was going to be there when I got home. I would spend quite a lot of time upstairs with Granny and Grandad. I would run errands for Gran as she never left the house. She would keep me supplied with cigarettes. I smoked from a very young age, about six. One day she asked me to take something to the great Aunt Mamie's house. I put it in a string bag and hung it from the handlebars of my bike. Going round the corner, the string bag caught in the front wheel and threw me over the handlebars. Amongst other injuries, I snapped off both my front teeth. The dentist said I was too young to do anything about them, so he just filled the stumps. These stumps were dead, the nerves having been removed, and they turned black, just at the time when I was beginning to think about girls. I developed a pretty bad inferiority complex. I had a smile that put off all girls. They didn't fix it for five years. I overheard one girl say, Can you imagine kissing him? The other one replied, That would be disgusting. I had a picture of my cousin Irene on a mantelpiece. I knew that she loved me. Every year my father would buy a one-week family runabout ticket and we would go on the train every day to Paynton at Goodrington or Tidmouth. We never went to Torquay. I think he thought it too posh there. Paynton had a great beach and pier. Goodrington had a miniature steam train and self-drive motorboats. They resembled dodging cars. At least they did when I drove them. It was outside Paynton Station when I was 12 that I was first addressed as Mr. The small boy said, can you spare us a fag, mister? I was pretty chuffed and I gave him two. It would have been easier to stay up there, really, but I suppose that would have been too expensive. One year we went to Blackpool for a weekend instead. We went up there in the back of a van. I was so tired by the trip I barely remember it. It took me to London once, just the two of us. We saw Windsor Castle, Madame Tussauds, the Planetarium, Regent's Park Zoo, Tower of London, 
Hampton Court and Battersea Fun Fair. We got back to the Bailey breakfast place. He turned on the taps and they were shooting water up the wall. They wouldn't stop. Everything was soaked. I thought it hilarious. There were at this time virtually no coloured people in Plymouth. No foreigners at all really. Some Polish refugees left over from the war was about it. The only two coloured people I knew lived around the corner in Cecil Street. There was the man who ran the shop halfway down the hill. He was an Indian. I thought this meant he was a Native American and so viewed him with awe. Then there was a black girl named Susan Ahmed who lived next door to his shop. She wasn't a part of our gang but was on friendly terms with us. She was one of those girls that developed early and she would allow us admiring lads to examine her new attributes. Susan committed suicide when she was about 14. I have no idea why. There were certainly no racial problems at that time. Everyone liked her. In 1963, Russian cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman in space. Also in 1963, the world was shaken by the assassination of the American President J.F. Kennedy. I was stunned. I had never experienced a cold-blooded act like this. Even the grown-ups who had lived through the extreme violence of two world wars were shocked. This event provoked a public outpouring of grief not to be seen again until the death of Princess Diana 34 years later. I started hanging out with a bunch of bikers although I was too young to ride myself. They would meet in the town centre and usually go for a ride somewhere. There was a beach cafe at Jenny Cliff that was a favourite destination. It had a jukebox and a great rock and roll ambience. They were a good bunch who just liked wearing leather gear and riding their bikes. There was occasional trouble but it was always someone else who started it. They were never enough for trouble. The bad reputation was largely a product of the media. There was, though, the Battle of Cones Green. We rode out to a country market at a place called Cones Green in Cornwall. The guys started chatting up the local girls, as guys do. The local farmers took offence and started a fight. The one who had a go at me was a monster. I managed to get a few hits in first, which had no noticeable effect, so I decided to see if he could run as fast as I could. The lads were in a sorry state when we got back to Plymouth. Jenny Cliff Beach Cafe is still there, but it has changed completely. No jukebox, no ambience, just the standard cafe now. The other favourite run was out to a cafe at Legger Mutton Corner in Yelverton. This one was usually undertaken as a race. The cafe is no longer in existence. Some of the racers didn't survive either. By now there had been a sea change in Britain. It had not been an evolution, but a revolution. Literally, overnight, an obscure Liverpool pop group called the Beatles changed the way Britain perceived itself. One day we were a dull, drab, colourless country with almost Victorian attitudes. The next, we were swinging Britain. Before this, there were no teenagers, really. You were a child, then at some point you turned into a copy of your parents. There were no separate clothes, music or fashions that marked you out as different from them. There were now. What followed was a riotous explosion of music, art, fashion and filmmaking. A totally unprecedented multimedia extravaganza that shook not only Britain, but reverberated around the world. We were the Brits. We were the coolest dudes on the planet. Of course, there was an attempt by the establishment to regain control and keep people in their place. The BBC, who had a total monopoly on radio programmes, refused to broadcast the new pop music. The only radio station broadcasting it was Radio Luxembourg. The signal was far away and very weak. You had to keep twiddling the tuner as it faded in and out. It was not long before the response came. In 1964, Pirate Radio Caroline started broadcasting from a converted lightship off the Essex coast. This was soon followed by Radio London, broadcasting from an old anti-aircraft platform in the Thames estuary. 
1967, there were 17 pirate radio stations broadcasting to 20 million listeners. The BBC capitulated and Radio 1 was born. There were, of course, retired colonels from Godalming writing letters to the Times complaining about the length of young men's hair and the shortness of the girls' miniskirts. In 1964, the US Civil Rights Act made it illegal to discriminate against coloured people in public. There was not much trouble between the mods and rockers in Plymouth. In fact, we were, all, we were all on friendly terms. A few years later, when I had my own motorbike, I went for a ride to Big Bree with another biker friend. When we came back to the car park, our bikes were surrounded by at least 30 scooters. We did what we always did, tough it out. We walked straight through them like we owned the place. I'm sure if we had shown any fear, we would have gotten a beating. By this time, fighting had become decidedly more nasty. On January the 24th, 1965, Sir Winston Churchill died at the age of 90. He was given a full state funeral, the only commoner to receive this honour. 320,000 people filed past his coffin as he lay in state in St Paul's Cathedral. He also received a 19-gun salute and the fly pass by the RAF. His coffin was pulled on a gun carriage, escorted by the household cavalry. In 1965, another Russian cosmonaut, Alexei Leonov, became the first man to walk in space. The Japanese had been making small motorcycles and mopeds for years. In 1965, the Honda CB450 with twin overhead cams, known as the Black Bomber, appeared on our roads. This bike outperformed all the British bikes on every level and sounded the death knell with the British motorcycle industry. Up until this point, Japanese and other Far Eastern products were viewed as very inferior. The decline in supremacy of British goods in the world markets started here with this bike. British industry had always ruled the roost and had become complacent. It produced products to suit itself rather than what its customers wanted. The Japanese took the trouble to find out what their customers wanted and then made it. Another factor in the decline of British industry was that German and Japanese industry was rebuilt with American money after the Second World War. It was therefore modern. British industry still utilised Victorian factories in plant. Also in 1965, the first US combat troops arrived in Vietnam. There have been US troops in Vietnam since 1959, but they were at least officially there as advisors. Closer to home, huge reserves of oil and gas were discovered in the North Sea. We were told that Britain would have cheap fuel for the foreseeable future. This did not happen. Our government weren't going to let us have cheap anything. We were charged the full world market price plus the heaviest taxation in the world. Did anyone expect anything less? I left school in 1966 at the age of 15, upholding the long and noble school tradition of having no qualifications at all. After trying out bricklaying and motor mechanics, I decided to enter Her Majesty's Dockyard Devonport as an apprentice. The entry level requirement for this was O level English and Maths. This means I had to sit in examination to get in. To my great surprise, I passed both tests and so became a coppersmith apprentice. There was a long tradition in the dockyard of initiating apprentices. This involved a whole series of very unpleasant and humiliating procedures. I became the first person in history to avoid this initiation. I did so by wielding a two-pound hammer at my adversaries in best Viking berserker fashion. There were no takers and no one ever tried to bully me for the whole of my apprenticeship. Sorted. I also saved another would-be initiate from them. His name was Rick and he is still a friend today. At this time the Russians became the first to make a soft landing on the moon with Luna 9. 
I wonder what the Americans have been doing. The Russians had so far been the first with everything. Unlike school, we had music in the training centre. It was 1966 after all. The Beach Boys were having good vibrations. The Kinks were having a sunny afternoon. Well, the Beatles were sailing about in the yellow submarine. On October the 21st, 40,000 cubic metres of colliery spoil, loosened by persistent rain, slid onto the Welsh village of Aberfan, killing 116 children and 28 adults. Being a coppersmith involved mostly pipe making and fitting, not just copper pipes but all kinds of pipes. It also involved sheet metal work, arc welding, oxyacetylene welding, brazing and soldering. I formed a strong bond of friendship with Rick and another apprentice by the name of Paul, the Saltash Malingerer. We called him this because every time he was given a difficult job to do, he would go sick and one of us would have to do it instead. During the summer we would take half days off and go up to the hoe to watch the girls go by. Usually several other apprentices would come too. In those days you only got 10 days a year holiday. We would take ten half days, which left five days in a lump. Another problem was the money. Our labouring friends earned about eight pounds a week. We earned two pounds four shillings a week. The big event of 1966, of course, happened on the 30th of July at Wembley, when 400 million people tuned in to watch Bobby Moore lead England to a 4-2 victory over West Germany and win the World Cup. Jeff Hurst scored a hat-trick, the only time ever in a World Cup that this has happened. The other goal was scored by Martin Peters. I was not around in 1945, but I can't believe that the moon was any more joyous when we were celebrating beating the buggers on VE Day. I met a girl named Verity. She was both blonde, buxom and willing. We went back to her home as her mother was out. There we were naked in her bed. For me, this was going to be the first time her mother walked in. Story end of. Shortly after this, I was at a party when a very pretty young lady had a right go at me and then left. I was totally bewildered as I hadn't even spoken to her. But a week later, I received a note from her through a mutual friend asking if we could meet. Intrigued, I went along and that's how I met my eventual fiancé. She apologised for mistaking me for someone who had done some harm or other to her boyfriend. 1967 saw us move to the second year training centre. Our boss there was an irascible old goat named Polly Perkins. Besides being a dockyard training supervisor, he was also a magistrate. He would shout and chase us about all over the place. We loved him. He wouldn't hear a bad word said about any of us from anyone. He saved Rick from the sack when he was convicted for the possession of cannabis. In over 45 years of working and about 18 jobs, there were only two bosses that I respected. He was one. This was the year that the Israelis and the Arabs went to war for six days. Despite being hugely outnumbered in main tanks and aircraft, that's all it took for the Israelis to trash the buggers. Plymouth based Royal Marine Commandos and Argyle Solent Highlanders were fighting in Aden. Nearer to home, the tanker Tory Canyon hit rocks and sank off southwest Cornwall, spilling 120,000 tonnes of crude oil into the sea. My father bought me a Lambretta scooter, and my first, my first journey was to live in Cornwall, and yes, I did fall off. The other guys got scooters as well. We would go on runs to various places on the south coast of Devon and Cornwall. I don't recall ever going anywhere without one of us breaking down. One day at a youth club dance in Salt Ash, Paul wanted to try each other's scooters. The youth club was at the top of a very steep hill. I set off down the hill on his scooter at a rate of knots. He followed behind shouting, the brakes don't work. At the bottom of the hill was a very sharp bend. I broadsided in the scooter, demolishing a garden wall. On May the 28th, we joined a crowd of 250,000 people on Plymouth Hill to watch Francis Chichester sail his small yacht, Gypsy Moth, to into harbour. 
He was accompanied by hundreds of small craft that had sailed out to escort him in. The 65-year-old had just become the first man to sail single-handed around the world. He had left Plymouth nine months and one day previously. He made one stop on his journey at Sydney for repairs to Gypsy Moth. He was later knighted for this achievement. Donald Campbell was killed whilst trying to break his own world speed record on Lake Coniston when his jet power boat Bluebird 2 flipped at over 300 miles an hour and rose over 50 feet in the air before disintegrating on impact with the water. It would be 37 years before his body was discovered. Our little group now also contained an art student called Dougie and Andy, who would sit the A-levels and play the guitar. Peter who also played the guitar and Hippie Allen, who was always stoked. And of course our various girlfriends. Susan and I were a solid item now. In those days, if you took a girl out, you were responsible for getting her home safely. Even if you were rowed, you would still take a room. Girls never ventured, in, in, ventured into pubs unless they were accompanied by their boyfriend or husband. If, like us, you worked in an all-male environment, it was difficult to meet unattached girls at all. This year saw the release of two of my favourite records, Procol Horum's White the Shade of Pale and Jimi Hendrix's Hey Joe. This was also the year when flower power hit British consciousness. There was a concert in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park attended by 20,000 people. They called it a being or a happening. This featured such acts as Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Big Brother and the Holding Company with their singer Janis Joplin. The concert was a gathering of people protesting against the war in Vietnam. At this time people were also experimenting with Eastern religions, psychedelic drugs, vegetarianism, anything really that was anti-establishment. By the end of the year, a hundred thousand disaffected young people had descended on San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. Scott Walker sang, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. Game on. There was a club in Stoke initially called the Purple Fez. This soon changed its name to the Van Dyke. They put on such bands as Jethro Tull, Free, Fairport Convention, Black Sabbath and The Cream. We weren't short of good bands to go and see. We would meet up with other club goers at the Waterloo in Paradise Street. This was the same pub where we drank at 14. We would have a couple of beers there and socialise. We couldn't talk much in the club. We would sometimes talk, talk to the DJ, John Peel, who often turned up. The Van Dyke was just across the road from a police station. If there was a queue outside, they would come across and harass everyone on the pretext they were causing an obstruction. Pretty much everyone was smoking the weed at the time. I had occasional one, but I was never into it really. Same for other drugs, I tried everything but didn't get into it. I preferred beer. We wore faded Levi jeans with inserts put in them to make bell bottoms and tie dye granddad vests. Calf Dan's or Zulu Dawn style Red Army jackets. The Colonels and Godalming were having apoplectic fits. The police tried to arrest me once for impersonating a soldier. The red jacket had reg regimental badges, which they claimed was illegal to wear unless you were a member of that regiment. And if you really to harass you. Long hair and beards were, of course, de rigueur. 1968 started with a bang. I rolled the Lambretta straight into a Morris 1000 car which pulled out from a side road in front of me. I suffered serious head injuries and broken scaphoid bone. Quite bad facial scarring and was black and blue all over. I was unconscious for quite some time. My friends who had been riding behind me thought I was dead and they informed my girlfriend so. I was off work for six months. I can remember looking down from above and watching as the ambulance men covered me with a red blanket and lifted me into the ambulance. This was my first out of body experience. I now knew I had a soul that was separate from my body. I was immortal. <laughs> the 
The experiment started me reading the books of Lobsang Rampa, who claimed to be a Tibetan monk. When it was eventually discovered that he was actually a plumber from Weybridge in Cornwall, he claimed to be a reincarnation of a Tibetan monk. Perhaps he was. The broken scaphoid bone never healed, however permanently broken wrist. The head injuries caused really bad migraines and this went on for about five years. The facial story gradually faded for a number of years and is now gone completely. Enoch Powell made his rivers of blood speech against mass immigration. Joe Cocker was rocked in with a little help from his friends. Arthur Brown was setting fire to his head while singing fire and the Rolling Stones were belting out jumping Jack Flash. In the wider world, the North Vietnamese launched the Tet Offensive. 80,000 Viet Cong soldiers launched a coordinated attack against the hundred towns and cities. This was a major turning point in the American public's attitude to the war. They had been led to believe that the Viet Cong were more or less defeated and incapable of any large-scale offensive. South African surgeon Dr Christian Barnard performed the first heart transplant. Black civil rights leader Martin Luther King was assassinated in Tennessee. 47 people were killed in the subsequent riots. The American Skipjack class nuclear submarine Scorpion exploded and sank off the Azores with the loss of all 99 crew members. And the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. In 1969 in January, we went up to London to visit Carnaby Street and the Portobello Market. We were wandering down Savile Row when we heard the Beatles playing. Everyone in the street just stopped and listened. We were all looking up at the roof of the Apple Building where the music was coming from, and though you couldn't see anything. We did, know that, did not know it then, but we were listening to the Beatles' last ever concert. It was a bit of a trip to drive to London back then. There was no motorway or dual carriageway, just a single track road that went through the middle of every town and village on the way. On a really good day, you could do it in eight hours. More often it was 10 or 12. Sometimes we would stop and spend the night inside the Stonehenge Circle. At the cinema, I saw the just released film Easy Rider and developed a lifelong ambition to own a Harley Davidson and ride one across the USA. It would be 42 years before my dream came true. When it did, as an added bonus, I would get to sit on the genuine Captain America bike used in the film. The Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders who were based at Crown Hill Barracks were moved out of Plymouth. I suspect it was because of the constant fighting between them and the Royal Marines. Union Street often resembled Rourke's Drift on a Friday or Saturday night. The city wasn't big enough for both of them. There were six aircraft carriers based at Devonport when I was an apprentice. The two I worked on the most were Art Royal and Eagle. My father went to sea on both of them during their sea trials. There was something special about Art Royal. The ship had a soul. It was a sad day which was broken up to make bean cans. I also got to work on an assortment of destroyers, frigates, submarines and the commando carrier Fearless. John Lennon and Yoko Ono had their week-long bed in for peace in the Amsterdam Hilton, where a few years later I was to work. And in Ethiopia, three million people starved as the result of a civil war. Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon after travelling in Apollo 11. I remember standing outside my fiancé's house as we looked up at it and thinking that he had lost something. Later I came to believe that the whole thing was a gigantic hoax. I don't believe Neil Armstrong ever went anywhere near the moon. The pictures from NASA were pathetically bad, with the US flag blowing in the wind, with the moon having no atmosphere, has no wind either. Then there were the dodgy shadows. The Russians were winning the space race hands down, they'd been first at everything and the Americans had to do something, so they faked it. 350,000 people attended a rock festival at Max Yansky's farm at Woodstock in Upper New York State, where famously Jimi Hendrix 
played the Star Spangled Banner and then set fire to his guitar. Britain was quick to respond when 150,000 people attended the Isle of Wight Rock Festival. I started out for this one but got sidetracked to a loving that hate all or dark or. Mistakenly I thought loving meant free sex. It actually meant sending good vibrations to the cosmic consciousness. I knew what I wanted to send and where I wanted to send it. I should have stuck to my original plan. Back in America, 250,000 anti-war protesters marched on Washington. This was followed by the first troop withdrawals from Vietnam. Cult leader Charlie Manson's followers murdered five people in the Beverly Hills house, including film star Sharon Tate. At home, Paul the Salt Ash Malinger and his girlfriend Vanessa and I went to the Rolling Stones free concert in Hyde Park. The Stones have always been my favourite band. John Lennon sings about holding a girl's hand and Mick Jagger sings about getting blue jobs from black girls. No contest. The concert took place two days after the death of former Stones guitarist Brian Jones, who drowned in his swimming pool. Mick read a poem for him by Percy Bysshe Shelley called On Keats' His Death and released 2,500 white butterflies. I found the perch sitting on the roof of an ice cream van and as there was no beer about proceeding with the makings. Well, this was a special occasion. This was the bestest concert I ever went to. Afterwards, we couldn't remember where we left the minivan and spent hours tramping about looking for it. British sailor Robin Knox Johnson and his tiny 32 boats of Haley became the first man to circumnavigate the globe without stopping. The death penalty was abolished in the UK. I know that there are people who deserve to die, but on balance from my personal observation, I would not trust the police or the judiciary to use this power fairly or wisely. Both have shown time and again that they are not on the side of victims of crime. Story end of. And now for something completely different, Monty Python's Flying Circus. We were not able to record television programmes back then. This was the one we all stayed in for. The antics of John Cleese, Michael Palin, Eric Idle and Graham Chapman had no precedent in comedy. They were pure genius. Dead parrot sketch. Enough said. British troops were deployed in Northern Ireland in the wake of the new IRA bombing campaign. My family were Catholics who came to Plymouth from Cork and Tipperary to escape the potato famine. The British treatment of the starving Irish was shockingly brutal. My family had gone to Ireland from the Scottish Isles of Lewis and Harris to escape the Highland clearances, also a shocking example of British brutality. Despite this, I do not condone the use of terrorism and I find the constant harking back to battles that were fought hundreds of years ago frankly pathetic. The British government had a long history of treating its own people with casual and uncaring brutality. One third of the world's population once lived under the British flag. It was the largest empire the world had ever seen. British industrial, industrial output exceeded the whole of Europe and the USA combined. It was by far the richest country in the world. At this time, children worked from dawn to dusk, six days a week for pennies. Children who could not find employment became child prostitutes. If you didn't earn, you didn't eat. Children as young as eight were hung or sent to the colonies in Australia and Tasmania for stealing a loaf of bread. I'm afraid the treatment of the Irish was no worse. They are not a special case. The hippie dream of love and peace ended at Altamont Speedway Stadium. This concert headlined by the Rolling Stones was beset by violence from the beginning. There was a fight when concert goers invaded the stage during the Jefferson aeroplane set and were attacked by Hell's Angels. During this fracas the aeroplane singer was knocked out. The Grateful Dead, unnerved by the violence, cancelled their appearance. This provoked more violence. During the Stones performance an Afro-American teenager called Meredith Hunter charged the stage wielding a gun and a knife. He was stabbed to death by the angels. As people left the concert, two people were killed in a hit and run and a body was found in a drainage ditch. 
it had been an eventful concert. 1970 was the year that my apprenticeship was completed. I left the dockyard immediately and became the road manager for a rock band. We lived at my flat in St Jude's but spent most of our time in London doing small gigs and having fun. We had two American guitarists who were students at Stanford University. This university had a campus in England that was at Cliveden House Taplow near Maidenhead. This is where we stayed while we were working in London. Cliveden is a huge country mansion on the banks of the Thames that belonged to the Astor family. It found fame in 1963 when it was the setting for the Profumal scandal. Secretary of State for War John Profumal was introduced as a society girl called Christine Keeler by the osteopath Stephen Ward. They had an affair. Christine Keeler was also having an affair with a Russian spy called Yevgeny Ivanov. This was obviously a huge security risk. When the affair came to light, Profumo denied everything. The newspapers were full of lascivious stories of orgies and naked swimming in the pool at Cliveden. The result of row brought down the government. I found Christy Keeler to be incredibly sexy and now quite enjoyed swimming naked at night in the same pool. I was a dirty old man even at 20. We got to meet quite a few interesting people. Beatles producer George Martin, Ringo Starr and Mark Bolan were probably the best known. I had broken up with Susan at the start of the year because I wanted the freedom to move about and to do different things. I found I missed her though. Girls weren't exactly hard to come by, love was. Jimi Hendrix died in London of a drugs overdose. The most influential guitarist ever was dead at 27. He had recently played at the Hall Isle of Wight to an audience of 600,000 people, the largest ever concert in the world. The USA invaded Cambodia. This provoked widespread civil unrest, culminating in the death of four students and the wounding of nine more when National Guardsmen opened fire on protesting students at Kent State University. Through the year, a succession of girls came and went, but often we share them. They never seemed to mind, neither did we. There was a pretty casual attitude to sex at the time. I started to read The Lord of the Rings. I couldn't put it down. I read it in one city. The Beatles disbanded. Rhodesia and Tonga gained independence from the USA. The age of majority in the UK was reduced from 21 to 18. One of the guys was in love with a girl who was running cool. So one evening he got a packet of salt and used it to make a ring on the floor. He sat in this ring and wrote, wrote her name and his over the top of each other nine times on a piece of paper. Then he set fire to the paper with a red candle and while it burned he chanted, like the flame broke the fire, red is the colour of desire. He then buried the ash in the garden. A few days later, she dumped him for good. I was pleased. Magic is one thing, but trying to make someone do something against their will is, in my view, black magic. I got the blame for this failure anyway, because I was taking the piss while he did it. Am I worried? <laughs> the first commercial flight of a Boeing 747 jumbo jet flew from JFK Airport to Heathrow. A Concorde test flight went supersonic for the first time. One of the original Melbourne Street gang was murdered in his flat. He was gay. He was always more girl than boy. He was a good person and was loved by all of us. The guy who killed him hated gays. The Aswan Dam was completed. Thor Heyerdahl sailed a boat made of papyrus reeds across the Atlantic to prove the feasibility that Egyptians could have crossed the Atlantic and taught Mesoamericans how to build pyramids. By the end of the year, the band is split up. Sadly, we had not made any money, but we did have a lot of fun. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. In 1971, I started the year driving a three litre V6 Mark IV Zodiac as a self-employed taxi driver. 
Well, the start of the summer, I was working as a lifeguard at Plymouth Hill during the day and as a nightclub doorman on Friday and Saturday at Ronnie's Club on the Barbican. 66 fans died in the stairway crush at Ibrox Park during a Rangers Celtic football match. Border clashes between India and Pakistan escalated in a full scale war when India invaded East Pakistan, now Bangladesh in support of their independence movement. The lifeguard job was great, posing in my white shorts and white t-shirt and chatting up the young mothers, usually in serious states of undress, whose husbands were busy at work. Rod Stewart and the Stones kept us entertained on the radio with Maggie May and Brown Sugar, respectively, and the sun just kept on shining. One day I saw a young kid in the sea screaming and waving her arms about, in front of an admiring audience of hundreds, I raced along the front, dived straight over the railings and swam furiously out to her, only to find she'd be waving to her mum. Britain adopted decimalisation and shopkeepers were prosecuted for continuing to sell in pounds and ounces to be used in elderly customers who didn't understand the new mates, weights and measures. 42 years later, I still don't. Margaret Thatcher stopped the free milk given to children in school. Henceforth, she would be known as Thatcher the Snatcher. Interestingly, free milk for school children was first started in Chicago by none other than gangster Al Capone, who funded it out of his own pocket. My watering holes these days were the dolphin on the Barbican, the Minerva at Britain's side, the oldest pub in Plymouth, frequented by Sir Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh, and the Clifton and the Providence of Green Bank. These were where the hippie crowd hung out. Living a few doors from the Clifton was the artist Robert Lankovich, who I knew well. He wanted to paint my mother as he had a great interest in the ill, the old, the destitute and the dying. My father would not let him. Robert used to commandeer empty buildings and open them up for the local tramps people with drug problems and other homeless people. The council hated him. There was one trap who they called Diogenes because he lived in a barrel. When Diogenes died, Robert wouldn't hand his body over for burial. The road went on until Robert's death in 2002, over 30 years later, when the body of Diogenes was discovered encased in clear plastic in the drawer of Robert's gallery. At this time, a young girl started to turn up at these pubs and at Ronnie's club. Her name was Krista. She was very young. There were plenty of guys about who would have taken advantage of her. I told the guys to mess with her and I'll mess with you. I had a pretty tough reputation then, having sorted out a number of well-known Plymouth hard men at Ronnie's club. Whenever she turned up somewhere, I took it upon myself to take her home. I soon became friends with her mother, Mary, big sister Anna. Her father Trevor, who was divorced from me, he thought that I had seduced his young daughter and came looking for me. He was an ex-para and tough as old boots. Although he was 22 years older than me, Trevor became my best friend. We went sailing together, did kung fu together and went drinking together. We used to go to a folk club in Salt Ash, run by an ex royal marine violin player called Fiddler Jennings. The IRA bombed the post office tower in London. Walt Disney opened this famous theme park in Florida. Greenpeace was born. I had to throw someone at Aronis one night for starting a fight. Nothing unusual there. He didn't want to be thrown out, unfortunately, and he got hurt in the process. I worked alone, had no backup, and couldn't afford to be gentle. This lad belonged to a large, well known fighting family. He had five brothers, all of them tough. They put the word out they were going to turn up at Ronnie's en masse and give me a beating. I walked alone into the pub that they hung out at and said, I hear you're looking for me. They were shocked. They said I had guts and bought me a beer. Tough it out. That's what I always did. Ex-British Army Sergeant Idi Amin seized control of Uganda. Sierra Leone and Qatar gained independence and after the summer I went to work as a hospital x-ray porter. 
I was now living in an attic room in a four-floored house in North Road West. The other attic was occupied by a blues pianist and singer who rejoiced in the name of Diz Watson. There was a piano on the ground floor living room and all the occupants of the house were gathered there to hear him perform. Stuff would be smoked, stuff would be drunk. It was good. Robert Lenkovich was a frequent visitor, as was Mike Brown. He was a local character and the owner of a shop called Mr B's Fun Factory that sold hippie gear. He drove around a big old black hearse. One day he had a heart attack and died. Problem with this house was that the only toilet was outside at the end of a long garden and I lived in the attic. If I woke up in the night, I would stand on the bed and pee out of the window. Problem solved. Legendary door singer Jim Morrison was found dead in the bath of his Paris flat. After a few months as an x-ray porter, I started a two-year training course as an operating theatre technician. I was finding this job very interesting. I bought books on anatomy, physiology and anaesthesia and I was studying hard. The first part of the training involved being able to do every job in the theatre normally done by nurses, including being scrub nurse and assisting the surgeon to perform the operation. We were also trained in recovery room nursing. The main part of the job though was assisting the anaesthetist. This was quite difficult as every anaesthetist had different ways of doing everything you had to know all the little preferences and quirks. We would prepare the anaesthetic room, drawing up the drugs that would be needed into the syringes and making sure all necessary equipment was ready for use. We would then receive the patient. The anaesthetist would arrive and put the patient to sleep, intubate them if necessary, while we would be attaching diathermy pads. Quite often the anaesthetist would then depart and leave us to look after the patient through the operation. We would be monitoring the patient's vital signs and controlling the levels of anaesthetic gases. The anaesthetist would be on call if there was a problem. It was a responsible job. I didn't have a girlfriend as such, just passing casual encounters. Trevor and I were working on a 25 foot catamaran to get it ready for the summer. This was playing gigs at the Breakwater Arms in Coxhide and at the Swan at Devonport, so we used to go to them. Sadly, both pubs are now private flats. The Paras opened fire on rioters in Belfast Bogsite, killing 14 people and wounding 12 others. This became known as Bloody Sunday. One of the young nurses at work was thrown out of the nurse's home for possessing the weed. I thought this was terrible. She didn't come from Plymouth and had no family here and they just threw her out. They should have at least let her make arrangements to travel home to her parents before they did this. At the time, one of the rooms where I lived was empty, so I said she could use that for a couple of days till she sorted things out. I knew the landlady wouldn't mind. I was woken in the middle of the night by wonderful sensations. Nuff said. The Japanese soldier in the Philippine island of Lu Bang surrendered. Second Lieutenant Hiru Anoda had been ordered not to surrender or take his own life. He lived for 28 years by eating plants and small animals. He refused to believe messages left for him explaining that Japan had surrendered. In 1972, the officer who had given him his order was taken to the island and ordered him to surrender. He returned to Japan a hero and later wrote a book about his experience called No Surrender. I was on the Barbican one evening with a friend. It was midwinter, pitch black, freezing cold and snowing. As we walked along the harbour wall, I thought I heard a faint cry but wasn't sure. I stopped to listen and heard it again. Someone was in the water. I told my friend to go to the nearby Three Crowns pub and phone for help. I jumped in the water. It was unbelievably cold. The shock was like being hit with a hammer and I realised that I only had minutes before the cold water would render me useless. I couldn't see in the blackness and so followed the sound of the cries. I found a woman who managed to pull her along 
the harbour side to where I knew there were some steps and lifted her out. An ambulance turned up and a police car. The ambulance took the woman away. The police, after taking down the details, left me there. I had a three mile walk home, soaked and freezing. I later received a letter from this chief constable thanking me for my assistance in saving this lady. I would rather have had a lift home. The Black September terror group kidnapped 11 Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympic Games. During a botched rescue attempt, all 11 were killed, along with one policeman and five of the eight terrorists. One of the benefits of working in the hospital was that every nightclub would leave a pile of free tickets in the nurses' home. If I wanted a night on the Raz, I just went over there and helped myself. I was friendly with several of the nurses who lived there and would often call in for a chat. Most of the other visitors seemed to be Royal Marines or sailors. In retaliation for Bloody Sunday, the IRA set off a bomb in Aldershot that killed seven civilians and wounded 90. I went down to the Dolphin one evening and woke up the following morning in the shop doorway. I looked about but couldn't recognise anything. I asked the passing stranger where I was and he told me the name of the street. I said, no, not the street. What town is this? I was in Portsmouth, about 160 miles from home. The British Embassy in Dublin was burned to the ground. Britain and Iceland, Iceland were fighting the Cold War. This started with Icelandic trawlers cutting the gear of British trawlers. The Royal Navy sent patrol boats to protect our fishermen. The Icelandic Navy sent patrol boats to protect their fishermen. There were incidents of the two navies ramming each other. In the end, after a four-year struggle, Britain lost when Iceland threatened to close a major UN base. Trevor and I decided to sail to the Scilly Isles during our summer holidays. The night before our departure, we were in the Dolphin. Someone asked us if we had distress rockets and flares. We hadn't. This guy went away and came back with some. The first day we sailed down the coast of Falmouth and spent a pleasant evening in a local pub trying unsuccessfully to coax some local girls into a spot of close quarter combat. The following morning the weather forecast was for a forsake gale. We thought we could get to the Scillies before the gale hit. We were 14 miles offshore when it started. We took everything but a small storm jib down and tried to deploy the sea anchor. We lost this because we forgot to make fast the wrap before we threw it overboard. The boat was taking a hell of a pounding and it was getting worse by the minute. I said to Trevor, that looked like your sleeping bag down there. He replied, I can see yours. There was a big hole in the boat. It was half full of water and stuff was floating out of it. We thought we were going to die. I felt really calm and peaceful. No panic at all. Trevor said, have you got any regrets? I said, yes, we didn't get a shag last night. We had a good laugh about that. We remembered the flares and fired off a maroon. This is a rocket that when it gets to the zenith of its flight makes a hugely loud bang and then the flare floats slowly down on the parachute. This was seen by Royal Naval Research that made full speed to our position. It was either HMS Fox or HMS Heckler I don't remember which now. We were saved. 120,000 Kong Viet Cong stormed across the border into South Vietnam. The Watergate scandal erupted in America. This eventually led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon two years later, the only US president to ever resign from office. The Cunard liner Queen Elizabeth was destroyed by fire in Hong Kong Harbour. In 1973, two prison guards escorted a prisoner into the anaesthetic room and someone invited them to go for a cup of tea. The prisoner asked me where they had gone and when I told him, he said, right, I'm off. When the guards came back, they panicked and tried to blame me for not stopping him or telling them. Do I look like a prison guard? A Libyan airliner strayed into Israeli airspace and was intercepted by two Israeli phantom fighters. Despite 
repeated requests to change course. The pilot refused. The airliner was subsequently shot down with the loss of all 108 passengers. One of the consultant anaesthetists was the most obnoxious man I'd met, mentioning no names, Mr. Waldron. He would pick on the youngest female nurses unmercifully until they were reduced to tears. One day after a distraught 17-year-old nurse had fled the room, I asked him if he obtained sexual fulfilment by doing this and they refused to work with him again. I had made an enemy, not only of him, but of the sister. Senior theatre sister as well. Thereafter she tried her best to make my life unpleasant. I felt that she, I felt that she had a care of duty. <coughs> I felt that she had a care of duty towards the young nurses in her charge and if she had discharged her duty properly the row would not have happened. Britain joined the common market. US troops left Vietnam. During an operation I was monitoring a patient when he went into respiratory arrest. I told the surgeon and I sent the nurse to find the anaesthetist. I decreased the anaesthetic gases, increased the supply of oxygen and added some CO2 to encourage breathing. I then breathed for the patient by using an ambu bag to keep inflating his lungs. When the anaesthetist arrived and took over from me, he asked me to fetch a particular drug that he wished to administer to the patient. This particular drug was kept in a dangerous drugs cabinet and only the theatre sister had the keys. When I asked her for this drug, she refused to give it to me. The anaesthetist was somewhat less than pleased. I took over looking after the patient again while he went to get the drug himself. The sister's office was halfway down the corridor. You could hear him shouting from inside the theatre. After the operations list was finished, I went to the sister's office and told her exactly what she could do with the job. The next day I went to the army recruiting office and I told them I wanted to join the parachute regiment. They said I was too old, but in view of my training they could offer me a job in the medical corps as a theatre technician. I declined. A couple of days later I hitchhiked to Harwich in Essex with the intention of getting a ferry to Amsterdam. I had enough money for the ferry and the train into Amsterdam Central Station but nothing left over. I was told that the Dutch wouldn't, wouldn't allow me to enter the country if I had no money. I used the money for my ticket to buy a very expensive camera from someone who was trying to raise the money for his train fare home. I sold the camera for enough to pay my fare and satisfy Dutch immigration. Walking around Amsterdam wondering what I was going to do next, I heard someone call out my name. This was unbelievable. Here I am in a foreign country that I've never been to before and the first person I bump into is an old friend from Plymouth, Bob Truscott. Pioneer 2 was launched on a mission to Jupiter and Saturn. Bob had a small bedsit just off Benin Brower's crack where I had somewhere to sleep. The next day I went to the Amsterdam Hilton and asked for a job. They gave me one as a kitchen porter. A train carrying 7,500 pound bombs and 18 railway wagons and a number of petroleum tankers bound for the Concord Naval Base caught fire in a railway yard in California. Over the next eight hours they all exploded. The nearby town of Antelope ceased to exist and 5,500 further buildings were damaged. Miraculously no one was hurt. My new boss was Manfred Brunner. A German. I had met the second boss I respected and liked. The kitchen wash-up area was staffed mostly by Portuguese deserters escaping from a war in Mozambique and Angola. It was a very busy place. It was very hot in there. Manfred personally come round with drinks for us at regular intervals and often ice lollies as well. At some point in the shift he would take our orders then we would f when we were finished we would have a get together, whatever drinks we had asked for would be provided free. Sometimes when there was a big event going on, he would ask us to do overtime. When this happened, he was always grateful and would provide us with a meal. 
In short, Manfred treated us with respect and he looked after us. We responded in kind and would do anything for him. A Russell Duper Love airliner crashed at the Paris Air Show, killing nine people. The Rocky Horror Show opened in London. Bob and I moved to a flat in a traditional old house overlooking the Vondel Park. One Sunday we were walking through the park and we heard this wonderful but familiar music. There on an island in the lake were Pink Floyd giving an impromptu concert. We were lying on the grass enjoying this. Bob fired up a spliff. We were approached by two policemen. They had a talk, said good stuff, gave it back and moved on. Sixteen Syria MiG-21s attacked a patrol of 12 Israeli Phantoms. 13 of the MiGs were shot down. The Israelis lost one Phantom. Concord made a test flight from Washington to Paris in 3 hours 33 minutes. I didn't spend long washing dishes. Manfred gave me a more interesting job. The hotel had many bars, restaurants, cafes and even a nightclub. It was my job to ensure that all of them were supplied with whatever crockery, cutlery and glasses that they needed. I was free of the kitchen. I had the run of the hotel. I would wander about to these places checking to see what they had and what they needed. I would then tell the Portuguese what to wash and where to deliver it. I had a pager so if anyone was running short they could contact me. There were many Israelis and Muslims working in the hotel and tensions were between them were growing quite high. The hotel was used by the Israeli El Al Airlines and in the current climate of hostility they had their own security people there to protect their cabin crews. One day as I was passing through the foyer three men waving handguns charged through the door. There were two guards looking after a group of El Al cabin crew in the foyer who were waiting for a crew bus to take them to Schiphol airport. The Israelis immediately drew their weapons and opened fire. Suddenly I was in the middle of a war zone. There's not a lot wrong with my survival instincts. I bolted for the nearest door and locked myself in. It happened to be the hotel manager's office. He was outside and understandably wanted to come in too. I told him to fuck off. No way on God's earth was I opening that door. It later transpired that the men were in fact French bank robbers who were being chased by the police. They had crashed their car outside the hotel and were trying to evade capture. The Israelis thought they were being attacked by Arab terrorists. One Israeli was wounded in the exchange of fire and both were arrested for the illegal possessions of firearms. I have no idea the eventual outcome. Mr Meyer never discovered who had locked him in his office. We had various English people staying with us at different times. We tended to pick up waifs and strays. Once a guy and his girlfriend we knew from Plymouth were staying with us they wanted to take the magic bus to India. To earn the money for this trip, they decided to perform in the sex theatre. This was a place where all kinds of sexual practices were performed on stage for a paying audience. Needless to say, Bob and I and a group of other friends went along. We sat right in the front and proceeded to take the piss unmercifully. Because of this, he was unable to perform and he didn't get any money or an invite back. I should explain that Amsterdam was an extremely free and liberal city. The sex trade was both legal and respectable. In the red light area, ladies sat in their ground floor windows in various states of undress. When a customer went in, they would pull their curtains. There were topless bars, naked bars, sex clubs. Everything was totally legal. I once went, once went into a nightclub where there were two doormen outside and they wouldn't let me in. They were monsters. I didn't fancy arguing and went somewhere else. Later I found out that these two doormen were women. It was a lesbian club. Israel was attacked. Egyptian, Syrian, Iraqi, Tunisian, Sudanese, Jordanian, Moroccan and Saudi Arabian forces launched a coordinated attack against Israel. This attack was timed to coincide with Israel's holiest festival of the year, Yom Kippur. When through religious observance they would be the least ready to defend themselves. 
On the Golan Heights, 150 Israeli tanks battled 1,400 Syrian tanks. In Suez, 500 Israeli soldiers battled 80,000 Egyptian soldiers. At work, this battle was being fought as well. Arab and Israeli waiters were fighting in the kitchens, attacking each other with anything they could get their hands on. Bob and I went to the Israeli embassy and volunteered to go to Israel to fight. They politely thanked us for our kind offer, but said that there would not be enough time to train us. Massive supply operations were launched. America to Israel and Russia to the Arab countries. Russia threatened to send troops to help the Arabs and America put its nuclear forces on high alert. The Russians backed down. After initial success, the Arab attack met increasing resistance as Israel mobilised its forces. After a battle lasting 19 days, the Arabs were defeated. I did my bit for the Yom Kippur War by putting pork and the halal food in the staff canteen. <laughs> I saw and played my first computer game, Atari Pong. It seemed incredible at the time. In 1974 found me still living in Amsterdam. I was now working as the personnel cook, preparing and serving food for, for the staff canteen. I had taken this job just for the sake of doing something different. In truth, I much preferred my previous job. It was the policy of the Hilton Group that if you worked in one of their hotels for two years, you were guaranteed employment at any other Hilton in the world. I had a plan. England was on a three-day week and the miners were on strike. Loyalist, loyalist paramilitaries exploded two bombs in Dublin and one on the border, resulting in 33 deaths and a further 300 injured. There was a Dutch girl called Elsa living in a basement flat. One day she asked me if I would drive her to the red light area. She had bought a van and was intending to entertain customers in it. Unfortunately, she couldn't drive. Ever the gallant, I drove her there and waited to bring her home. She had only one customer all evening and he asked for his money back. I drove her home. I have no idea what happened to the van. Back in England, National Front and anti-Nazi communists clashed in London, leaving one communist dead. Argentina's Juan Perón died. Rock music was amply catered for in Amsterdam. There was the Paradiso and the Milky Way. Lots of big name bands and local talent played in these. The pubs often had the bar in the middle of the room. You paid before you left. The barman would keep a tab. Mine probably said, long haired English twat. There were tea houses where you could sit for hours smoking the herb and sampling dozens of different teas. The Dutch never put milk in their tea. They don't use salt, pepper or vinegar on the chips either, they use mayonnaise. I got a letter from Anna. Krista had been killed in a motorbike crash at Charles Church Roundabout. Someone had been giving her a lift home from Ronnie's and had taken the corner too fast. The news shocked me. I was depressed and for the first time I wanted to go home. A few days later I did go home. In Cyprus, Archbishop Macarius was ousted by the Greek army. An IRA bomb killed four people and injured 44 in the Tower of London. I enjoyed being back in the bosom of my family and decided to stay home for a while. I took a, took a job as a bus conductor though I didn't like it. You had to do split shifts and other weird hours. Also I didn't like taking money from old people or disabled children so I didn't. The job came to an end when I went to collect the fare from some lout he was misbehaving and upset than the other passengers. He was big and aggressive. His first mistake was refusing to pay. His second mistake was saying, what are you going to do about it? The ticket machine wasn't damaged at all. I don't know what the fuss was about, really. 
I was working at Ronnie's again. Turkey invaded Cyprus. Trevor had a serious girlfriend now and she sold her house. Um, uh, she had sold her house and moved into his wonderful little flat in Turnchapel. They were using the money from the house sale to self-build a feral cement yacht. In the Dolphin one evening I met Roger. Roger was an American who owned and lived on a 63 foot steel tugboat. We became friends and did all the usual drinking and chatting up girl stuff that boys do. One evening we met the crew of a large deep sea Russian fishing boat that was moored in Mill Bay docks. They invited us aboard and everyone was getting pissed on their vodka. Roger told them that he had some porno books. To cut a long story short, the Russians got a few porno mags and Roger got both fuel tanks on his tug field. Later to I was to have cause to wonder if this was not more than it seemed. Nixon resigned, the only US president ever to do so. Dr Christian Barnard performed the world's first piggyback heart transplant. Roger said he wanted to make a trip to Holland in the tug. He asked me and another friend of mine, Paul, not the South Ash Malingara, if we would crew for him. I thought it would be fun, and, and there was money in it. We had a pretty uneventful trip over, but when we got there, Roger had no chart of the inland waterways. We ran aground in the dark and couldn't reverse off. We went to sleep, and when we awoke, there was no water in sight. We went for a walk around. Our next adventure was to accidentally ram someone's moored speedboat against the pier. The guy was pleased though, he couldn't sell it and now he could get his insurance money. Everywhere we went the police would show up asking to see our passports. Every time we moored up somewhere they'd show. I thought this rather strange. I was surprised by the Dutch canals. There were big barges so full that only part of the boat was visible above the waters were the bow and stern. These things used to move very fast and you would see that they were often being helmed by children. We eventually got to our destination, the town of Dordrecht, where we stayed with a girl called Marianne and spent several days sightseeing and drinking. Roger disappeared. I quite fancied Marianne. One day we took the tug to a place called Hendrikino Ambacht. It was an incredible place, a scrapyard for ships and boats. There was every type and size of ship that you could imagine. There was not much wrong with a lot of them either. Ships are scrapped when there is no longer work for them. Paul and I spent the day exploring. The next day, having failed to impress the lovely Marianne, we set sail for Plymouth. Grenada was granted independence. A Turkish DC-10 crashed in Paris, killing 346 people. I was at the helm, the other two being asleep. I was expecting to spot the Eddystun light flashing at any moment. Much to my surprise, I saw a very large Sea Link ferry. I called them up on the radio and asked them for their position. I had to explain we were lost. It turned out we were not far off Sherberg. So much for my navigation skills. We had only been back in Plymouth about a week when Roger offered us another job. He introduced us to an Irishman who told us he had just bought a fishing boat in Plymouth. He said he was going to start a fishing business in Galway and wanted someone to deliver it over there as he couldn't spare the time to, to take it over himself. Our alarm bells started to ring for you, dear reader. Bloody didn't for me. A man fired six shots at a Rolls Royce carrying Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips in the mouth. Princess Anne's bodyguard and chauffeur were both wounded, as were a policeman who tried to intervene and the passing pedestrian. We were some miles offshore in this quite large fishing boat when the stern glands started leaking very badly. We tried to adjust it by tightening the screw down but there was no more movement left in it. Water was pouring in, hitting the flywheel and spraying everywhere. Also the sea was quite rough and it was getting dark. We discovered that there were no powered pumps, only one very large hand operated pump. We decided to head for Falmouth and to try and make it in before we sank. We took turns, two on the pump and one steering. 
we were losing. The water was getting deeper and we were getting tired. After an exhausting effort, we managed to berth the boat in Falmouth. Paul and I returned to Plymouth, leaving Roger to sort out the boat. 28 people were killed in Lincolnshire when a chemical plant exploded. The rumble in the jungle. Muhammad Ali killed George Foreman in round eight to regain the world heavyweight title in Zaire. It was to be several years before I discovered what was going on, although I'm sure you have guessed already. Roger was an IRA gun runner. I have never kept a diary, a memory being what it is, I'm sure that some of these events are out the sequence. I clearly remember the events I'm narrating here, but I'm sure of the exact chronology. I can't date working at the Amsterdam Hilton accurately, because I was there during the Yom Kippur War. I have just realised that the story I'm about to recount actually happened at an earlier moment in the plot. I have no intention of trying to figure out how to fit it into its proper place. I shall beg your indulgence and just recount it anyway. Mandy was a local doctor's daughter who was part of my circle of friends. She went to Guernsey to work in a hotel for the summer. She was caught smoking the weed and they sentenced her to six months in prison. Guernsey at one time had no drug laws and as a result lots of hippie types went there. It was heavily dependent on the holiday trade and this started to suffer as wealthy visitors started to stay away. Guernsey instigated an automatic six month sentence for possession of drugs, though I didn't know this at the time. Bandy became very depressed in prison, there was not much I could do to help, but we decided to pay her a visit to try and cheer her up. I visited Mandy twice. Then one morning I was chatting to a Canadian guy in a cafe on the seafront. The police came in and arrested the both of us. This guy was apparently a drug dealer that they were after. They wanted me to sign a statement saying that he had tried to sell me drugs. I refused to do this as it was untrue. Things turned very nasty. I was stripped naked and badly beaten. Later I was urinating blood. I still refused. They said unless I complied, they would say they found drugs on me. I refused. They put me on remand in the prison where a legal representative was provided for me. He told me that the court would never believe my word against that of the police. He said that if I pleaded guilty, he could get me off with leaving the island and agreeing not to come back for five years. The magistrate said, how do you plead? I said guilty. He said six months. It was my job in the prison to dish up the food which was cooked by the women prisoners. There was only one, Mandy. I had to go to the women's section to collect the food so I saw Mandy several times a day. There was one guy in the prison who had two heavies looking after him. He ruled the other prisoners by fear, taking tobacco and such things from them. When they approached me, I told them I was going to do them if they if they bothered me, what I was going to do to them if they bothered me again. They never got more tobacco or anything else. One day I was called to see the governor. My mother had asked if I could be transferred to Dartmoor Prison as she was unable through ill health to make the trip to Guernsey to visit me. Dartmoor was at the time Britain's maximum security prison. You had to be a serious criminal to be sent there. People like Cray Twins enforcer Frank Mitchell, known as the Mad Axeman. I politely declined. The highlight of the week was Sunday when the Salvation Army band played in the garden. There were women and they wore black stockings. Mandy committed suicide shortly after her release. Shortly after my release, I saw a gang of guys beating up a policeman. I didn't like policemen but I don't like gangs beating up one person either. I waded in and started dragging people off the policemen. The, then more policemen arrived and everyone, including me, was arrested. I was only released when witnesses came forward to say that I had been trying to help the policemen. 1975 saw me working at the Royal Naval Hospital in Stonehouse as a general porter. We had to work night shift on a rotor system. 
and there was only one, ever one porter on duty at night. The mortuary was, a se was separate from the hospital in a very dark unlit part of the grounds. Added to this, the light switch was on the opposite side of the mortuary to the door. I suppose the electrician thought that was funny. The, ref the refrigerator had only three shelves, so you would often have to leave bodies on the floor. You could arrive at the mortuary with a body and then have to cross the room in the pitch blackness, trying to avoid bodies on the floor to switch the light on. It was even worse when you were leaning. General Franco died, leaving the way clear for democratic reforms in Spain. The first disposable razors became available. One day I was called to the accident and emergency department to collect the body of a girl. She had been at work at the Royal Naval Armaments Depot in Ernie Seto and a torpedo had slipped off a hoist and hit her in the back of the head. I remained unmoved by most of my visits to the mortuary because it was most always old people. This is natural, old people die. This was different. This girl was about 19 or 20 and very pretty. She had gone to work this morning just as I had and now I was putting her in the refrigerator. It made me realise how tenuous our lives are. She was young and alive and now she wasn't. Just like that. One of the other porters was also a drag artist. He was an effeminate homosexual who had a wicked sense of humour. He was extremely entertaining and he couldn't stop laughing at his antics. I decided to wind him up and told him that I dressed as a schoolgirl at home. I spent the rest of my time there fending him off. I didn't mind the work. It was delivery meals, medicines, patients, equipment and anything else that was required to and from the wards of various departments. Much better than being shut in one place all day. During slap periods I read a book. Margaret Thatcher became the first female party leader. 43 people were killed and a further 74 injured when a Northern Line tube train failed to stop and crashed into barriers at Moorgate Station. Despite being surrounded by nurses, I didn't manage to inveigle my way into any of their affections, let alone their underwear. They were all Royal Naval nurses and none of them seemed to be interested in us civilians. What made it harder to bear was that they all wore black stockings and suspenders. Civilian girls at this time wore more tights. Oh well, no one ever said life was fair. I went out with a girl who told me that I couldn't go round to her place because her ex-husband was very jealous and beat her up, beat up anyone she went out with. No way was I going to stand for that. I knew he ran a cafe in Stoke, so I went there to sort him out. This was the first he'd heard that he was an ex-husband. The Terroth Kota army was discovered in China. Two people were killed and 63 injured when an IRA bomb exploded in the foyer of the Hilton Hotel in London's Hyde Park. One of my friends bought an old BSA A10 with a sidecar. Never having ridden one before, I begged a ride. I thundered up the dual carriageway in Exeter Street and went straight across the large roundabout at the top. I didn't know you had to accelerate the turn left on a combination. I was, I was braking and so couldn't make the turn. Paul, the South Ash malingerer, lent me his car. It was an Austin Healy Frog Eyes Sprite. I'd always fancied having a go in it. The handbrake didn't work, which made it quite difficult on all the hills. You had to twist your foot sideways and use your heel on the brake and your sole on the accelerator. What Paul neglected to mention was that he drained all the oil out of the engine and hadn't yet replaced it. The good news is that I didn't have to make many very tall hill, hill starts. Viking was launched from Cape Canaveral on a mission to Mars. Midway Games released the first microprocessor arcade games machine. I was starting to notice that certain things were becoming difficult to find. Jobs were starting to become scarce and so were friends and girlfriends. Everyone was either married or getting married. It was getting quite difficult to find anyone to have fun with. My ex fiance Susan had been married for a couple of years to Malcolm, an old friend of mine from the early days. 
My phone book was full of people who were no longer available. This was the year that The Who released their rock opera, Tommy. Tuvalu gained independence. The last 1,000 Americans were evacuated from their embassy in Saigon as North Vietnamese troops closed in on the city. The embassy was besieged by South Vietnamese civilians also hoping to be evacuated. Four US Marines were killed trying to hold them back. It took 81 helicopters 19 hours to complete the evacuation to aircraft carriers waiting offshore. The last helicopter carried the last 11 Marines who had been acting as a rear guard. As the year drew to a close, I spent Christmas at 11 Melbourne Street with my family. We didn't go to Midnight Mass now. Uncle Joe was dead, Cousin David had married and moved away, and my grandfather, a lifelong devout Catholic, said he no longer believed. My brother Jeff was not around either. I went out on the town on New Year's Eve and got very drunk. I remember bringing a woman home and having very noisy sex with her. I can remember the headboard was banging on the wall and she was moaning a lot. In the morning, my mother brought a breakfast tray in to wake us up. To my shock and horror, I saw the woman must have been 60. At least she didn't ask for payment. 1976, after the debacle of New Year's Eve 1976, I got off to a quiet start. I was feeling restless and wanted to do something, but I didn't quite know what. Most of my friends had settled down to married life, and most of their wives viewed me with that best suspicion and that worst hostility. There were two exceptions, though. Both of them seduced me. The song Convoy by C.W. McCall was released. This kick-started a campaign for CB radio in the UK. The CB for UK slogan appeared everywhere. As always, the government resisted. They didn't want people having the means to contact each other by radio. The first commercial flights of Concorde from Heathrow to Bahrain and from Paris to Rio de Janeiro began. There was a different mood of foot in the UK now, a palpable sense that things were going wrong. Our manufacturing industries were in decline. After their success with the Honda CP450, the Japanese were turning their attention to electrical goods and pretty much everything else. British employers were starting to close down their factories and relocating to new ones in the Far East, where wages and conditions were much lower than in the UK. At the same time, uncontrolled immigration into the UK was bringing ever-increasing numbers of foreigners here to compete for work in a diminishing jobs market. Employers are fond of saying that they have to bring foreign workers because British workers won't do the jobs. This is an outright lie. They bring them in because they work for less money and the worse conditions. Our government is complicit in this. They have a long history of keeping the working class poor. Queen hit one million sales of Bohemian Rhapsody. Viking 1 went into Mars orbit after a 10 month journey from Earth. One day in Cornwall Street I met a girl outside of Steading Simpson's shoe shop. She was with a friend of mine called Ginny. She turned out to be Ginny's cousin from Essex and was down here on holiday. Penny had a little green mini that I promptly drove into the back of a delivery lorry. I was distracted by a lady in a very short skirt who was bending over a push chair. And like me, the lorry driver was so distracted that he jammed his brakes on too. Despite this inauspicious start, I went back to Essex with Penny where we started our life together on the floor of a house in Tullesbury belonging to her friends Sylvia and Kelby. After about a week, we moved into her mum and dad's house in Sybil Hedingham. We found employment at Goldhanger Fruit Farms at the time the largest canning factory in Western Europe. Neither of us liked working there, so we applied for and were accepted as nursing assistants at Bridge Hospital in Whitton. This was my first experience of a working environment where whites were a minority. One of my colleagues, a girl of Pakistani origin named Sarata, fancied a charge nurse called Vincent. He was from Ghana. She explained that her father would never let her go out with him because he was black. 
She was absolutely shocked to find that I considered her a black too. Penny and I got married at Braintree Registry Office. I recall her father saying that he wasn't going to, to go to a wedding where the groom was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I said I didn't remember inviting him. He came anyway. A group of pro pastillion terrorists hijacked an Air France flight of 229 mostly Israeli or Jewish passengers and forced it to land at Entebbe Airport in Uganda. Three unscheduled and unannounced Hercules transport aircraft landed at Entebbe and disgorged 200 elite Israeli commandos. In a 35 minute battle, all seven hijackers and three of the victims were killed along with 20 Ugandan soldiers and the Israeli commando leader. 11 MiG, MiG jet fighters were also destroyed. This amounted to one quarter of the Ugandan Air Force. Penny and I applied for a mortgage and bought an old fisherman's cottage in Talsbury. My father paid the £500 deposit for us. On the day we moved in, we had a cooker, a sofa, a bed and an ancient TV. I don't care what official rep weather records say 1976 was and remains at the time of writing the hottest and longest summer of my life. It was absolutely scorching. It was just as well that Salisbury had an open air salt water pool. I think we spent every spare minute in it. My brother Geoffrey moved up to Cambridge to study modern languages at Trinity College. All his studying had paid off. We spent the rest of the year settling into our new house and our new jobs, gradually filling the house with things to turn it into a home. The Seychelles, Trinidad and Tobago and the Gilbert Islands all achieved independence. The Sex Pistols released their Anarchy in the UK single, Punk Was Born. Punk was a reaction to the increasingly complex progressive rock that required genius level musicians to play it and sounded dreadful. Music became once again something that ordinary people could aspire to play. 1977 found us both still working at the hospital and furnishing our little cottage. Penny had brought her dog with her, a small old and smelly poodle called Candy. I called her Candy Puffer on account of the noise her breathing made. She was much loved. A computer specifically designed for home use was demonstrated at the Chicago Electronics Show, the Commodore Pet. We invited a Filipino nurse for a meal at our cottage. Although it was only a small terrace, two up, two down, with a bathroom and kitchen extension, she was amazed that we lived there alone. She said she could not believe all the space was just for us two. Apparently in the Philippines it is normal that three generations of a family live in a two-room shack. This girl later later married an American, 30 years her senior. She wanted to live in the USA. He was also very wealthy. The worst air crash in aviation history occurred in March when the Pan Am 747 and the KLM 747 crashed into each other at Tenerife Airport. 583 passengers were killed. This was about the time that Penny became pregnant. Elvis Presley performed a concert in Indianapolis. It was to be his last performance. We went to Cambridge to visit Jeff and after showing us around we had dinner in the Great Hall with the students and masters. In the halls of residence there was a rule written in Latin. Its English translation read, all female housekeepers must be old and terrifyingly ugly. Don't suppose it made much difference after a few beers. Jeff reckoned that the library contained just about every book ever written. Our Uncle Eddie had written a couple of books on spiritualism. Sure enough, we found copies there. One was called No Beginning, No End. I forget the name of the other one. Mark Boland died in a car crash in Barnes, South West London. We went home to Plymouth during our holidays. My mother was thrilled she was going to become a grandmother. She had always wanted a daughter and was disappointed that both her children were sons. Ray Rum won the Grand National at Aintree Racecourse for a record-breaking third time. Elvis Presley died at home in his Graceland mansion. He was aged only 42. 
Back in Tolsbury we had now got everything ready for the arrival of our daughter. We felt that it was the perfect place to have children as it was at the end of a road. There was no through traffic, so very few strangers. It felt safe. Well, compared to somewhere like Plymouth it did. We would get up in the morning and there would be a bag of baby clothes on the doorstep. This happened all the way through both my daughter's childhoods. All the mothers in the village knew whose children were the next size down from their own children and passed on the clothes, toys and anything else that their children had grown out of. We did the same later as our children grew. The first Star Wars film, Star Wars film was released. Back then if you wanted to see a film you had to go to the pictures. Video machines had been invented some years before but they were not very good and also not generally available. Also, films were not available to buy or rent in a, in a video format. Fibre optic cable was first used to carry telephone traffic. We got a phone call to say my mother had been admitted to hospital. This time things were looking bad. Penny and I went down to Plymouth. We stayed for about a week and visited her constantly. This wasn't a bad sign in itself as back then they had strict visiting hours. These were only relaxed in the most serious circumstances. I realised that this was the end, I knew that she was not going home again. Despite this, I had to take the decision to go back to Tolsbury. Penny was nearing term and I was a AWOL from the hospital. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life was to kiss my mother goodbye and walk out of that ward. I knew I would never see her again. She died about two weeks later. Back in Plymouth for the funeral, the family gathered at Melbourne Street. Some of them complained that I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. My grandfather, who was sitting in his favourite chair, wearing his best suit and collar and tie, said nothing. He disappeared into his bedroom, and when he reappeared, he was wearing his old gardening clothes. The complaint stopped. I will never forget my grandfather doing that. It was only a week or two later that Amber was born. I'm sure that my mother only lasted as long as she did because she wanted to see her first granddaughter. She nearly made it. I was present at Amber's birth and seized her from the midwife as soon as she came out. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Penny was sitting there eating fish and chips as she was being stitched up. I asked the doctor to put an extra one in for me. Amber spent her first night on earth in a linen cupboard. It was a broken window in the ward and a very cold draught. We had our first Christmas as a proper family. I must say it felt wonderful. I soon got used to changing nappies and to doing nighttime feeds. I used to be afraid to take her out for a walk in case she was damaged and I kept checking to see if she was breathing while she was asleep.